Well, one of the biggest problems in the African-American community that's not often talked about is the lack of knowing how to swim. Leading organizations we talked to today say black youngsters are five times more likely to drown because almost two-thirds of black children and teenagers have no experience in the water. The effort today to try to turn that around. Swimon Foundation and British Swim School sponsored lessons at a center in Florissant in North County. It's designed to teach more black youngsters how to swim, a skill that could save their life. The drowning is the leading cause of death for kids one to four, and it's the second leading cause of accidental death for older kids, particularly African-American teens dry, die at a rate um, significantly higher than their white peers. So we really wanted to make swim lessons and knowing how to swim available because swim lessons can reduce drowning by 88 percent. The swim school provides premium life-saving lessons and Swim On Foundation provides tuition assistance and is dedicated to water safety and drowning prevention. The groups took the added step to get their point across by inviting the Mako Swim Team, the region's all-black competitive team, to that event to inspire kids. We talked to one of the head coaches of Mako. They introduced to track they introduced to football, basketball, baseball, but they never would know swimming can be a sport that could take them to college, to the Olympics, professional now, it's a professional sport. I want to give them the opportunity to see, hey, learn how to swim. First, it'll save your life, and now it can be your life. Here's a parent of one of the Mako Swim Team members. Very important. It's a, a great life skill to have. Um, you know, it saves people's lives, so you know, anytime you can save someone's life is very important. We thought it'd be a great uh, inspiration to our kids to have the Mako swim team come talk to our kids and then show them what a competitive butterfly stroke looks like, for example. Uh, that, that would really get our kids enthusiastic about the lessons. Now, the organizations say the lessons are even more important now that we're approaching the swim season. The cows. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the global system of white supremacy. Today's date, Tuesday, September 24, 2024. So I have been told that was audio from the state of Missouri wow everyone is talking about Missouri right now for different reasons with Marcellus Williams privileged black male get to that later but that was a PSA from the state of Missouri from the beginning of the summer talking about black children not being able to swim drownings that have increased over the last several years especially with COVID-19 wow that is so important we'll be here tomorrow at same time 8 p.m. Eastern 5 p.m. Pacific some of these same issues but back tomorrow but wow we have talked about swimming for so many years here at the cows one thank you to my black mother for getting me swim lessons life saving skill then I just mentioned retired firefighter for years he has dialed in talked about that and encouraged hey if you are a parent especially a black parent get your child into swim lessons if you don't know how to swim as a parent they got swim lessons for adults too you can learn with your child which is a great bonding experience right um, but talking about hey seeing that the tragedy Black children go out swimming during this time of year, well, a little bit, a few weeks before probably, summertime, going out to swim, no lifeguards. They've been talking about lifeguard shortages too, and the tragic results. Mm -hmm. He's talked about that for years and encouraged, learn how to swim. If you have a pool, have lots of safety measures in place neighbors children might be attracted and hop the fence and dive in all of that be really responsible if you do own a pool but with regards to pools and racism white supremacy whew, the cup spilleth over there are so many reports about deliberate white supremacy racism and pool access 
it would hurt my brain computer. I did a whole YouTube video about this back in the summer of 2015. Remember that one? That was when the officer did the barrel roll at the pool to toss the black children out. That was in Texas, so that kind of is off limits since we're talking about North Carolina. Uh, down in Florida during the 1960s, they had black children at the pool. White man literally dumped acid in the pool to get the Negroes out of the water. They just go on. Whole book. The land was ours. Andrew Carl. What is that book about? Specifically, it's not just white people deliberately taking black property. It's specifically taking waterfront property from black people all across the U.S. We do not want black people having beaches or beach access even. Pools all oh, it just goes on and on. In fact, even from all over the world, because we've talked about this in the context of South Africa as world, all over the world, I remembered obscure way back over a decade ago, we had the author of Fear and What Follows, White Man in Louisiana, talking about his childhood. This is just one little snippet. He writes, We went over next to Alan, Olin, and some others who were Gawking. Pickaninnies won't be swimming here a while, a woman said to us. Too bad they did it at night, the man with her said. Daddy shook his head and whistled. Maybe this'll put a stop to some of this integration nonsense. Better off this way. Allen pointed at the exposed lockers, benches, and bricks heaped and scattered before us, explaining to a disinterested Olin how the dynamite had worked. I tried to put it all back together in my mind. Many a time I had changed into my bathing suit and showered off the chlorine water here. The shallow foot wash at the exit to the building always had colder water than the pool, and I enjoyed the tingle it gave my feet before and after I swam. I wondered if it had survived. I strolled a little ways from my daddy and brothers so I could see past the debris to the pool. I'd missed swimming there. I'd liked not only the chilly water, but the energy of so many people and how my mother relaxed when she sunned in a lounge chair. The pool was still blue, but drained of water. I remember doing cannonballs off the low board, dunking my friends, screaming without a thought. I missed it. Something I loved was gone taken by negras I thought blown apart be because of negras ends there goes on to the next section 1969 pyrrhic victories but the I guess you can insert your own adjective I'll choose at least for now the goofy part is I've forgotten how many of these where white people went and bombed the pool to keep black people out. This is just one that I remembered offhand where we did talk to the white author about this specifically. 15 years of the cows. All of that said, when I saw the report just a few weeks back, the abandoned pools of Columbus County, North Carolina, specifically wow I have heard all of this before even though this is very specific details for locations that I didn't know but whoo painfully familiar and then with the end result you have lots of black people who don't know how to swim <sighs> real world consequences for generations of deliberate willful white supremacy racism so important particularly we have so many listeners down in North Carolina I thought it was so important to talk about this and again encourage black parents in particular get your children swim lessons if you don't know how to swim learn with your child or children 
our guest who wrote that report, The Abandoned Pools of Columbus County. Uh, he is a reporter at the Border Belt Independent and a graduate of the Hussman School of Journalism and Media at UNC Chapel Hill. Go Tar Heels! Really thankful he could hang out with us to talk about this really important subject matter and this specific report. Uh, joining us live, our guest, Mr. Ben Rappaport. Uh, Mr. Rappaport, you with us, sir? Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, really a pleasure, and, and that setup was really, really great for all the stuff uh, I hope we'll delve into further tonight. For sure, super important subject matter. I guess, I, I guess it is official autumn now, but... It is warm enough mm-hmm. in a number of places where I am sure people are still doing some swim time. Uh, I'm in Washington State where, I mean, it's below 70. It was sunny, and it was warm enough you could have been doing some outdoor swimming. So very relevant, and I'm sure we'll see summertime again. So I guess before we get started, uh, anything you would like listeners to know about who you are and the work you do, uh, Mr. Rappaport? Yeah, just to let listeners know a little bit more about us, I'm a reporter with the Border Belt Independent. We cover rural southeastern North Carolina, so we cover four different counties down here, um, and they're all pretty rural communities um, struggling with all the all the various issues that poor communities face, uh, from healthcare access to uh, a broadband to uh, poverty to joblessness, and so. We're covering a, a variety of issues, and, and the story with the pools is just one of the many issues that we cover. But, um, of course, all of these things are all intertwined when we talk about uh, issues of, of racism, white supremacy, um, and really rural decay at large. Fascinating. Uh, and you all can read this report. We talked about it before, but if you want to read the report, borderbelt.org hit the website and should be easy to find the abandoned pools of Columbus County uh, for listeners who've not seen you you are classified as a white man is that correct Mr. Rappaport yes yeah. yes that is correct absolutely right. Right on. were you born just asking were you born in North Carolina or are you transplant uh, I am a transplant I was born in Southern California and my family moved to Raleigh uh, the capital city in about 2014. And then I moved down here to, to report on more rural areas, uh, after I, I graduated college. So, okay. Good that's my, know. my path to get down, down to the Southeast. Gotcha. You've been there like a decade now though. So you're almost, almost kind of. Exactly. Home. Exactly. <laughs> okay. North Carolina is definitely home. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we start our programs. Uh, racism is such a, a enormous component of this specific report, and you've done some others where it also crops in there. Uh, that term mm-hmm. racism, I use that term as a synonym, racism, white supremacy, same terms. I use the same definition for both that definition, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you think such a Mm. system exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? Uh, I think, you know, I think there, that is fair in, in a lot of ways. I think, an interesting thing that that brings up for me, especially in the context of the story that we're talking about, is the ways in which um, racism as a as a force in society really keeps us all down, regardless of our skin tone. It, and, you know, when we think about the context of the swimming pool um, here in Columbus County, for those who who haven't read the story, and I assume most of your listeners have not. Um, here in Columbus County, there are six uh, former swimming pools. None of them are currently active anymore. Um, that's public pools and community pools that were once hubs of community and things. Um, and they were really drained or left to be overgrown or whatever, largely due to forces of racism. 
Um, many of them were abandoned during the age of integration. And now we have uh, no pools in our county for anyone. So it, it, all that to say, I think racism is a force that, uh, while it certainly directly keeps down people of color consistently, um, it also really hurts all of us because it denies us of resources that we could all have in a better, more just, more open uh, society. Hmm. I have to, I have to process while I'm, while I'm processing, I'm going to circle back as I'm processing. Uh, did you get to swim at all this summer? Uh, I, so I did not swim this summer. Like I said, I moved down here, uh, probably about a year ago now, a little over a year ago now. And, uh, come to find out there's no pools. And I, I took, I think I maybe went down to the beach. I'm about an hour away from the beach here in, in White Bull, uh, North Carolina. And, um, so I went down to the beach one time, but did not swim in an actual swimming pool this summer. (laughs) Okay. Gotta be careful with the with the questions i just asked did you get to swim this summer i didn't say if you got to swim in a pool specifically so did you get to swim this summer yeah yeah i guess i guess in that regard i did swim in the ocean uh, a little bit a little bit okay he did get to swim this summer took some effort i guess <laughs> one question or yeah it is one question or request I'll make one of the ways that I've noted that white people deliberately practice white supremacy racism, just like keeping black people away from pools and swimming areas is they will mm-hmm. not answer questions. Uh, sometimes they will talk uh, in a way sometimes they just talk for a long time. It seems like they did, or they'll be really clever, but I would request if you could answer, make sure you answer the question. doesn't matter if you agree or disagree or whatever you can give us all the, the context, but if you could, truthfully answer the question can we make that request sir absolutely absolutely much obliged thank you kindly okay i have to circle back he did get to swim this summer important uh did you say the definition that i gave for white supremacy racism is accurate mr rapaport yeah i think i think that is largely fair okay i remember he didn't use the term fair uh before okay I thought it was significant and you are a journalist. So words are important. Um, You said that certainly the system of white supremacy, racism, it keeps black people, non-white people. It keeps them down, us down. (laughs) So I'm one of those, Mm -hmm. but you said it hurts us all. I thought that was significant. Listeners know for a well over a decade at this point, I've pointed out metaphors the first one where you were exclusively talking about non-white people, metaphor, keeps them down. When it can included white people, it hurts us all. In the illustration you gave was that white people in some of these areas, they don't have access to a pool either. Am I accurately kind of paraphrasing your response? Uh, I think so. If I'm interpreting you correctly, I think so. Okay, make sure I'm not uh, misinterpreting. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I've heard that frequently, that racism harms mm-hmm. everybody, meaning white people and non-white people, that everybody, white people are also victims of racism. I have not seen evidence that that's true. And that's why I asked if you've been swimming. I am sure there are some white sacrifices where, darn, global warming, climate change, it would be really nice to go hop in the pool. We, just like the book that I read from the start, they said the same thing. Like, dang, I liked going to swim there, but you dynamited the pool. I can't even go. Hey, mm-hmm. as a white person, just like our guest, it is much easier for you. Well, we could go to Carowinds. I'm sure disproportionately, you mm-hmm. got lots of black people. They did not have the opportunity to go to the beach and get a swim. And I mean, there, this is not just Gus T giving opinion. There are lots of metrics that show quality of life and on down the line. Poor white people, even they are not the same as even the poor black people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes even the poor, excuse me, the wealthier black people are way worse off than even poor white people. 
in the system of whites. You could be a poor white person and you would know a white person who owns a pool. Done deal. Are you going to be a black person that knows a white person that's going to allow you to come hop in their pool in North Carolina? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a great point. I totally agree. Very common that I hear that. And I just I ask people to think of any other crime. When they talk about when they talk about Diddy. They don't say he is also a victim. They don't say that you just have perpetrators and victims. When you talk about the crime of white supremacy, racism, perpetrators, victims, same way we think about any other crime, just trying to be logical, especially when they're dynamiting pools and such. all over the world. They're dynamiting pools. Uh, you included it in your uh, response. Whiteville. That, is that the correct pronunciation mm-hmm. of the it's Whiteville? Is that the pretty correct? Yeah, yeah, that is that is the name of the town I, I live in, believe it or not. Uh, oh. Yeah, I know, I know. What is the, have you sourced, like, what is, is that named after a person? Why is it called Whiteville? Yeah, it's uh, named after a uh, a white family, but with the, the last name White. Uh, so, that's, yeah. I see, and I know they got, so it's John. I know, it is, it is uh, it's always an eyebrow raiser when I tell people that's where, that's where I live. <laughs> hey, I still learning because I've been to a lot of areas of North Carolina, but I haven't been to Whiteville. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a reason. <laughs> um, the and they have yeah. is it John B. White Highway? Is that it? Uh, James, yeah, James. Yeah. Thank you, James B. White Highway. Is he connected to the Whiteville same clan white group? I believe so. I believe so. Okay. I was looking and it said that John, oh, excuse me, James, thank you, James White, that he was a big plantation owner, lots of property and such. That's why he got the highway named after him there. Is that accurate? Do you know? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. I can't say I've done a ton of uh, research into that, but I don't doubt that that's the case. I'll say that much. Awesome. I'm I'm still learning myself and I've never been here and I just learned all this today. So I could have got some bad information. So anybody who lives in well, we have listeners down there, you all can check easy. And let's see, is James White, who they named the highway after, is this plantation owner owned all this property there? That's why they gave is that same person or is it somebody else? Make sure we're accurate. Just pointing all that all of that, I think, is relevant for the whole net. And this all this location that we're talking about like columbus county this is like 60 (laughs) minutes from wilmington uh north carolina is that correct about an hour or so yeah yeah okay yeah is that in fact is wilmington is that in the county one of the counties that you normally cover or is that too far uh wilmington is a little bit outside of our normal coverage area okay um we cover if you're if you're looking at a map of north carolina i always tell people we cover the, the southeastern diagonal part. Um, so Columbus County is like right at the end of that diagonal. And then we cover all the way up to right around where um, Charlotte is in an area called Scotland County. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. That's a good graphic. Okay. I like maps. Wilmington is outside. I will <laughs> say it is it is close enough. 60 minutes away. The purge of 1898 also. It is close. Sure. Weighs on my or was Definitely. weighing on my mind as I was reading all of this, and we've talked about that before. Um, what uh, man? What exactly uh, called your interest to investigate these abandoned pools? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, actually, a photographer friend of mine sent me a message on on Instagram one day out of the blue and said, um, "Hey." I went to this abandoned pool in a different area of the state. uh, And I heard there's one in the town of fair bluff, which is a town about 20 minutes from where I live. Uh, Would you go, I check it out, see if it's there. Like, let me know what you see. And I did, I went down there and uh, it was just a shocking sight. Honestly, it was gross. And there was, you know, stagnant water and there's mold and weeds growing everywhere. Um, And it's right next door to 
the senior center there in Fair Bluff. Um, and I was just thinking like, wow, it's so, so disturbing that there's this eyesore right next to this senior center that people are going to every day. Um, knocked on the door of the senior center and uh, most of the senior center is older black folks. And they said, you know, I was talking to them, like, do you know anything about the pool? They said, no, we don't really know too much about it because we were never allowed to swim there. We've never been allowed to swim there. Um, it's always been a whites only pool. And so that really just sort of piqued my interest. And from there we found, or, or I shouldn't say we found, there, there were several other abandoned pools across Columbus County that um, we found and discovered and um, learned more about. And each one has a unique history that is almost almost always intricately connected to uh, racism and the history of segregation in this country and particularly in the rural South. Um, when we very first started our reporting, we thought about making this more of a statewide story, but we quickly discovered that there are just too many of these abandoned pools to do justice to that story, to tell the story of every single abandoned pool in North Carolina. Um, I, I don't even know the number <laughs> that, that it would be, but it, I, my guess is that it is well over, well in the hundreds. Um, and like I said, each one has a unique community that has lost something as a result of losing that pool. And each one has a unique story to tell about why it closed and when it closed. So that's a little bit about how we dug into the story and, and how we sort of discovered uh, the magnitude of, of this issue, I think. Great details. I guess we can uh, give kudos to Tracy Watts. Great imagery to accompany the report and telling you to go out. Even the names once again. So we, uh, Mr. Rappaport, he said fair in the response about the definition. Uh, we have Whiteville the James White mm -hmm. Highway and Fair Bluff. Man, <laughs> like, does mm -hmm. everything have to be named white? Can anything, can we just pick non-colors maybe? Blue Terrace? Anyway. <laughs> um, with, yeah, the senior yeah. with the senior center that, that did, you said it was mostly black people at the senior center who said, oh man, yeah, that's the pool that we weren't allowed to go to. When you say like mostly black, is it like 60% black? Is it we're talking just maybe two white people like how mostly black is it you know i was gonna say so there's usually on any given day because we went down there ended up going down there several different times i'd say on any given day there's usually about a dozen uh you know older seniors down there and i would say probably about 70 75 percent of them are, are black on any given day the town the town of fair bluff itself it should be said is uh, about about exactly two thirds black and one third white. So two thirds black. Oh, okay. So the senior center kind of reflects a little bit mm -hmm. the dynamics of the town, I guess. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Okay. Uh, because I think yeah, you mentioned the senior facility in the report were you did you say in the report that they still kind of self-separate at the facility yeah yeah i think that's something we noticed uh almost immediately tracy watts and i um, went down there like i said several times and i think that's something we took away every time after going there is just like how they do kind of continually self-separate it brought to mind that that book that i'm sure um a lot of folks have of many of your listeners may have read or at least heard of, which is like, why are all the black kids sitting together in the lunchroom? Um, brought together that some of the, some of the quotes from that book for me. Oh, that's classic. That's another cliche. That's right up there with um, white people are victims of racism. I am. It's uh, to me amazing how frequently that book is brought up by white people and non-white people, even in the context of what we're talking about with the pools. I've said for years, man, and even in the context specifically micro micro of the senior facility, mm -hmm. if it's 70 percent black or 75 percent black, 
man, in my view, if you've got this minority white population, they are separating themselves, which is the history of white Mm. people around the world. Not the 75% majority has said, no, did you hear any black people say, oh, no, we don't kick it with, did any of the black people say, we don't want to talk to you, we don't kick it with white people? You know, I think in, in Fair Bluff, there is this, like, general, uh, like like you say, kind of self-separation in a lot of ways, um, and, and almost like a contentment in a way. Content, I don't know. I don't want to use the word contentment. I shouldn't say that. But there is, like, definitely a self-separation in the town there, for sure. The question again, sir, uh, did any of the black people tell you we're not going to talk to you we're not going to talk to you we don't have contact we keep separate from white people no no all of them were were willing to talk to me and and very open and um yeah that's what i mean like i haven't seen an evidence a record of black people saying we are going to be separate from white people the dynamics of white power We don't even have the ability to do Mm -hmm. that if we wanted to. Maybe the Wilmington Purge wouldn't have happened if black people had enough power to say, whoa, 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 you don't even get to come in this neighborhood. Back up. That's not what we have here. And I keep I'm just saying the numbers, if it was 75 percent white and 25 percent black, man, if you told me they were self separating man <laughs> like really the black people told you yeah we don't even want to try to kick it with them we just get our little corner and stay over here any white people that even try to come over here yeah i would have a hard time believing that unless you had like direct video quotes just logically for me the numbers just don't make sense if you didn't hear any black people tell you we don't kick it with white people we have signs up just like we've seen with white people we have signs up and we have justified reason to have some animosity or grudge against people classified as white. I don't generally hear that from black people. And it's 75% black. I think this is just that 25% of the white people being racist. We don't want to hang out with the black people. I think that would be more. I could be wrong. I didn't talk to anybody there. Uh, The get back the discrepancy with the numbers This is the same thing. Sometimes the numbers do a lot to communicate the story. I had to go back Mm. and look at it like three or four times. Man, it's at Mm -hmm. the beginning of the report. The discrepancy in pools. My goodness. So they have 309,000 public school, excuse me, public pools. Sorry about that. 309,000 public pools. In North Carolina, 10.4 mm-hmm. million private pools in North Carolina. You yeah. had to go back and underline bold print like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> 309,000 public pools. Mm-hmm. 10. And, and just to be clear, that's. Just to be clear, that's 309,000 public pools in the country, not not in North Carolina. Oh, thank you. Thank you. In the total country. In the total so country. Just, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Just wow. 10.4 million private pools. That's whole mm-hmm. country. 157,000 yeah. yeah. total pools private and I think that's specifically the county that we're talking about. Make sure I'm going back to get, but I mean, oh, that's nearly all of the 157, uh, yeah, 157 total pools in the state. 157,000 is the total number of pools in North Carolina. Right. So that belong to private that, residents. Yeah, they don't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, I mean, to be clear, a lot of the data on this is is fairly uh, shoddy at best. So North Carolina like doesn't have specific data about how many public versus how many private, but um, pretty much in our research, we found pretty much 
all of those, except for maybe, you know, a handful. Certainly there are less than a hundred public schools in the state of North Carolina. I would, I would feel pretty confident in saying that. Wow. Wow. He did say the data sh- is shoddy. We'll take that. Mm-hmm. More mm-hmm. studies needed, but it's, I haven't really seen much that would lead me to conclude that there are lots of black people that have pools. And I really haven't seen much to lead me to think that there are lots sure. of public pools lurking out there that we've missed. And, oh, man, we dramatically undercounted. They're really like five. I have seen nothing that would suggest it. It might even be lower <laughs> for the public pool. So who knows? Um, that alone yeah. is, is pretty staggering. And, I mean, even that, like, wow. I mean, is it with particularly I started this I said this should be thought of in the context of climate change as we are told I know that not Mm. everyone believes that but I mean we've had some really hot days that means there are a lot of public places where he just said where I live there's no public pool that's even staggering Mm -hmm. to think about moving forward in a warming climate yes yeah yeah absolutely I think um, you know, I, I talked to, for this story, I talked to the author of a book called The Sum of Us, which is um, all about the forces of racism and how it, you know, has really hurt, uh, particularly the rural South. And the focus of the, the book, or one of the main through lines of the book, is all about swimming pools in particular and how they, they hurt um, the, the country and or, or how the, the segregation of swimming pools particularly hurt the country and Um, So that author is Heather McGee, and she was saying, in particular, the ways that losing pools nowadays is especially harmful because there's so many people just looking for a way to cool off uh, that that aren't going to have access to that resource um, unless they have the the resources to build a pool. And uh, in a lot of rural areas where poverty is high and uh, racist attitudes prevail that there just isn't access to those resources to, to make pools a publicly available commodity. Mm, that goes back to not knowing how to swim. And even one of the consequences mm-hmm. from that, that might mean you have a lot of children who do not know how to swim going out to rivers, mm-hmm creeks whatever it is where there's no lifeguard and their swimming skills are questionable yeah. and that was included in the report as well again real world consequences to not having a pool in a warm incline i know those days here uh in seattle washington where we don't even have warm weather like that we had those triple digit heat days oh man they said that was the deadliest weather event in the history of washington state we have earthquakes here and it was Mm -hmm. a heat wave so swimming access water is super important uh on a warming planet you mentioned uh miss mcgee historian david seleski i think i got it right hope i'm saying his name correctly my apologies you um, seselski thank you david seselski said swimming pools and other bodies of water were frequently a flashpoint for white supremacist ideology. A lot of white people were more willing to talk about black and white kids going to school together than they were swimming pools. He said, at least at school, black kids had their clothes on. And I even thought, wow, that's saying a lot because, I mean, wow, there were some... (laughs) They bombed and mm-hmm. did all that to keep black people from going to school as well. So I don't know. It's kind of like six in exactly. one hand, half exactly. dozen in the other. But I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that quote really stood out to me when, when I was talking to uh, Mr. Sotelsky. And he's a historian of eastern North Carolina in particular. So he focuses a lot on this region and has written a lot about um, the the coup of, of Wilmington, um, and so I think, you know, when we, we talk about these things, it's just really evident that pools and water are really this, in many ways, like a symbol, but also a force to, that allows racism to, to flow, if you'll excuse my language. Um, I think it should be said too, you, you were, we were talking, or you mentioned earlier about 
you know, going down to rivers and streams and things like that. And it should be mentioned that Columbus County in particular, where this story is based, is really surrounded by water in a lot of ways. We have the Waccamaw River to the south, the Cape Fear River to the east, um, the and Lake Waccamaw in the middle, and the Lumber River also in the southeast. So there's water and streams and riverbeds everywhere. And so if we don't teach kids, particularly uh, particularly black kids, how to swim, it's really a matter of life and death in a lot of ways. And, and I think that that is something that, that often gets overlooked, especially when we talk about this region of the country is that there is water everywhere. And so not being able to, to teach kids to swim has dire consequences. On a warming planet. Mm-hmm. Our guest, Mr. Ben Rappaport. We have lots of water around us as well here in Seattle. I hadn't thought about that. Yikes. Wow. You have children in an area where they have lots of water. Wow. It would be imperative. Teach your child to swim. The sooner, the better. The sooner, the better. The sooner, mm-hmm. the better. Man. Uh, mm-hmm. Wow, that hmm, I hadn't thought about. I don't have children, so I hadn't really considered that. I do uh, give pause. I'm gonna have to. I didn't know about Mr. Seleski's uh, work, but I went to his website to check out some of his books. I'm going to do some reading, um, but I do hear that frequently as well. And that's one. I think it's just it's it's the same error when the term segregation is used and use that in your uh, report and you said it with us this evening. Um, are you familiar with Jay Strom Thurmond? I know I'm slipping a little south, but I mean, eh. uh, I won't say I'm intimately familiar, but I, I know vaguely a little bit about him. Okay. He's South Carolina. So you don't have to be an expert. You've heard mm-hmm. his name. I'm sure. Uh, South Carolina yeah. legend, U.S. Senator was going to run for president for a time. Legendary figure, legendary racist. In fact, one of the very people, not in our schools and all that, probably was leading the chart, not in our pools either. He's the exact Mm -hmm. type of person that I point to and say, this is not about segregation. This is not even about black people and white people keeping their clothes on. This dude did about, he Mm -hmm. lived to be 101, so he had a century of public dedicated racism unquestioned and Mm -hmm. he raped a black child and fathered children with her she wrote a book Essie Mae Washington Williams dear senator this is not about separation between white people and black people and that's like forever that's like Thomas Jefferson Sally Hemings this is not about separation at all the plantation is not separate even the sexual intercourse component that's been going on for eons. Uh, I could bring up the Duke uh, Mm -hmm. lacrosse case and what have you, but that's different time period. But I mean, that's what I mean. The logic of, I don't know if you're familiar with Strom Thurmond having these children. Did you know that or not? Uh, I was not aware of that. No, that's super important part because that's what, and I brought this up with so many people They'll talk about Strom Thurmond Mm -hmm. and racism as though it's separation between white and black people. That's not what this is. That's why my definition is it is about uh, abuse, subjugation and abuse. It is not about separate. You can't have a plantation if we're separate. Wilmington would have been fine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was just about separation. That is not what it. Jay Strom Thurmond wouldn't have been raping black children if this was about separation. They do do a lot of lying and saying that, though, but that's that's not what this is at all. Not at all. We wouldn't even have slavery. They mm. would have left the black people in Africa if this was about separation. Um, the I look super important just to get people to think logically about get non-white people to think logically about that. Um, you talked or you wrote specifically in the 1950s and 60s, at least six pools were built across Columbus County in Chadbourne, Fair Bluff, Lake Waccamaw, Ridge, Riggowood. Is that it? Riggowood. Riggowood? Oh, sorry, yeah, Riggowood. Riggowood. There we go. And Whiteville. Many were community-owned, meaning residents paid membership dues. All of them 
however, were racially segregated and denied access to black residents long after integration in other parts of the country. Where were you able to verify that this happened, that these were all excluding of black people? Uh, yeah, so we just talked to community members and every it, we talked to people of all classes and creeds in each of these six communities and every one of them told us, yeah, you know, uh, it was racially segregated when the pools were, were open uh, in the early days. So white people, not that... even, not even segregated. They were whites only. Yeah. <laughs> whites, I love it. White people verified this to you as well. Yes. Yeah. One I point out also so frequently, just like with the schools, So frequently, individuals classified as white and unfortunately many non-white people victims assert that the problem is that white people are ignorant about white supremacy racism. I say hog wash. That is not the case. The experts are the people classified as white. And I'm not surprised white people are aware we did not allow probably a number of the white people who were around to exclude the black people from those pools are probably still alive. Do you think they forgot? Mm-hmm. Let's see. The uh, Did you find any black, like a collective of black people get together and say, hey, we are going to build a private pool for black people. Did that happen? Was there an effort to get that done? Uh, so I haven't, I, uh, there's an interesting answer to that question, which is, that I wouldn't say there is like an organized concerted effort of black people doing that. However, um, I will say in white bowl, um, there is a a man who does a lot of community work. He's a a prominent community organizer, a pastor, uh, and a, I would call him a black activist in, in white bowl, um, who, who has done pretty well for himself and has a pool in his, yard and he at one point was offering swimming lessons to other black families in the community if if they were willing to you know basically be in his backyard but should be noted that of course that's not a community resource it's it's literally somebody's backyard so um that that's about as close as i found to to an effort on that front wow i'll that's the sort of thing i think is important too just in talking about the enormous wealth disparity uh, which you touch on explicitly Mm -hmm. in your report between people classified as white and people who are not white which is why I say it's it's just no comparison even so called poor white people if you have access to other white people that can do a lot if you are even sometimes if -hmm. you are a rich black person they don't let you in the pool either isn't that true? They don't let you in the pool. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. They don't let you that in the is, school. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they yeah. Don't let you well, in the uh, the, I was gonna say the the one. Um, you know, we're talking about community efforts, really, to to do this. And one of the things I think it is worth pointing out is that um, there was an effort at in the recently very recently in the in 2019 through to to just last year there was an effort to revitalize a couple of these pools and get them up and running and really to target swim lessons towards children of color at these reopened pools um they were going to partner with the ymca down in wilmington to to make this happen and it was a committee of you know prominent folks from the community colleges to the school district, to the hospital, et cetera. So all these people, prominent community leaders get together and, and talked about reopening the pool and how important it was and talked about pretty openly about the history of, of why these pools weren't available to everyone, um, the racist forces at play. And yet still through all of that, uh, it, it really, it was just not possible to, to keep these pools open. Um, Part of that is due to funding. Part of that is due to prevailing attitudes that, that persist in, in our county. Dang. When you say prevailing attitudes, what do you mean? 
uh, prevailing attitudes of racism, essentially, is what I mean. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for being explicit. My, that, that's yeah. not ignorance either. Oh, I'm so glad you gave us that extra tidbit because, I mean, hey, I am not. I don't even live in North Carolina. I live three time zones away. Mm-hmm. And I, oh, wow, mm-hmm. that's really dangerous. Swim less. As you said, even white people are being harmed at nap, nap, nap. <laughs> Why? How about let's make amends? We shouldn't have closed all those pools. We shouldn't have restricted black access for all those years. You said in fair, fair bluff, they had stock owned pools, but they did not mm-hmm. offer stock to black people. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And I'm sure many of those white people who did all that probably still alive too. That type of thing. How about let's make amends for that since we, you know, that's generations of black people who got excluded and couldn't swim. And let's make amends for that and do the, nah, nah. <laughs> that, that's not yeah, ignorance. Yeah. That's, yeah, that is, that is fair. Um, but a fair point. That is, you wrote Grayson Jarvis, 33. Is he white, Grayson Jarvis, before I get finished the sentence? He is, yeah. He is, okay. Yeah. Grayson Jarvis, he's in Fair Bluff, a member of the town council. It wasn't intentional segregation, but black families typically didn't have that kind of money, more com- uh, didn't have that type of money to invest in the pools. I read that, and I said, wait a minute, this in fair bluff they didn't even sell the stock to the black people so it was irrelevant if you had the money or didn't have the money to go what i just asked i said that before if you're a black person even if you have money it was still no no nigger beat it so that's Mm. what i mean i said man you you are practicing racism like that's not i mean at minimum that is flagrantly not true is what he said, is that true, that this wasn't intentional segregation? So I think to, yes and no. So to give some context to what he's saying there, um, he was talking about that in the context of the la- the latter stages of the pool being open. Um, and it closed down. So it was owned by families or through stock for years and years up through the 90s. And Uh, or sorry, up into the early 2000s until it just became financially unfeasible. And so what he's saying is in those later years that black families didn't have the money to buy stock. Although, you know, who knows if I, I, you know, couldn't verify how many black families tried to to buy stock at the pool. So uh, I think I think your assessment is, is certainly not far off. Man, I (laughs) given everything that we've read, even if the black people did not have the funds, why Mm -hmm. is it that the black people mysteriously are all poor? I mean, everybody there is just incompetent and couldn't get their act together to apply to UNC (laughs) Chapel Hill. I mean, really, Mr. Jarvis, really? Yeah, it just and this pattern mysteriously has been replicated all across the country how in the world (laughs) did that happen magically and this is another one that they use the same excuse for lots of things schools and almost anything that's constructive anything unless you're talking about crack Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah black people got lots of that yeah yeah they do anything else they're just lazy and I don't know. They just don't want to do it. They didn't have the money or weren't interested, didn't put the time in, couldn't stop watching Michael Jordan, whatever. <laughs> uh, let's see. The, uh, you I was did... going to say. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Sorry. Mm-hmm. No, I wanted to hear from you. You were going to say? I was just going to say, I think um, one thing that, that is important here is like, yeah, there there just is a very clear. Um, I don't know, mainly just to say that I agree with you there about that assessment, that there is this idea all over the country that, that, um, you know, (laughs) black people are poor and white people are not. It's like, that's obviously not the case in, in so many facets of life. And it's really just used as a, a restrictive barrier to, 
to entry in, in so many things, whether it's the pool or, or otherwise. Things that are constructive. Absolutely. Dare I say, probably mm-hmm. even the School of Journalism at North Carolina. How many black classmates did you have at Chapel Hill? Yeah, that is, I mean, that is absolutely the case. Um, I <laughs> probably, I, I don't have an exact number, but it is definitely a predominantly white school at a predominantly white institution. Uh, I'll say that, but I don't know exactly how many. Mm, mm. I thought that was important because he's a not, journalist. Oh, you said not. <laughs> I was going to say probably definitely not more than, you know, I think the journalism school has about a thousand graduates every year. And my, my rough guess is that probably a quarter of those are, are black journalists. Mm. Hmm. Wow, I have to ponder but on. I, I was gonna say I'll have to fact check that later and get and get back to you. I would appreciate. See, love it. Strive for accuracy. Yeah, I would be curious to know because yeah, that's. I mean, man, like I mean, journalists should be, should be said too. Should be said if we're talking about the North, the UNC Chapel Hill uh, School of Journalism. Um, there was a, a big scandal there not so long ago that was all about Nicole Hannah Jones, the author oh, of the 1619 yeah. Project. Yeah. Um, you know, they were going to offer her this position that was supposed to come with tenure. They didn't offer her tenure at this project because Board of Governors uh, essentially said that <laughs> her teachings were, you know, part of a, I don't know, liberal woke mindset or something. Um, and so... Yeah, I think that's an explicit example of racism. And I think that in a lot of ways, that that uh, denial of her tenure was driven by uh, Walter Hussman, the, the namesake of the journalism school, who uh, has been a uh, is when we talk about like old racism in the newspapers, like Walter Hussman is a, a prime example of it. Wow. I had forgotten all about that with the whole skit. That's right. She ended up not even taking the job. Man. Uh, and a journalist. Mm-hmm. Journalists are important for so many. Oh, that's man. Mm, mm, mm. Why, and they did. Mm-hmm. They did. It was specifically because she was speaking out about racism. That was exactly like, I don't know. <laughs> we don't <laughs> like, oh, that's so great point glad i asked mr uh, rapaport where he his alma mater michael jordan rolling over in his grave yeah. and lawrence taylor <laughs> uh the yeah I, and charlie scott even more well charlie scott's still alive but yeah <laughs> as are michael jordan and lawrence taylor my inside joke just yeah. goofing around um the quote at the end where you brought it matter of fact you had already mentioned I was gonna say, so I just, mm-hmm so I just pulled it up here just before we get off this point. The student population at the UNC School of Husband School of Journalism and Media is uh, 55% white, 12% Asian, 8.8% Hispanic Latino, 8.6% black, uh, and then much smaller percentages of, of every other race. So eight, 8.6% black journalists. Hmm. Hmm. That seems really under repre- I mean yeah that's yeah. eight points like yeah. that seems re- like what I Michael Jordan rolling over in his grave oh my god that is mm-hmm. terrible and it's almost 2020 that is terrible that's about what I would expect for the po- anything constructive just what I said unless it's a line for crack cocaine or cigarette menthol cigarette something like that unless it's something really really bad that's going to kill you pork rinds hot dogs I don't know tackle football Unless it's that, no way. It's going to be really difficult for you to get access for it if you are classified as black. Even the pool, even the pool. And then, and then they mm-hmm. will say, this is not intentional white supremacy racism. We just couldn't find applicants or black people didn't have swimming trunks or mm-hmm. whatever other excuse that we come up with for the day. Um that quote from Heather McGee, because you already mentioned her in her book, The Sum of Us, What Racism mm-hmm. Costs. And when she says it, she says it. She said the same thing. The sum of us, what racism costs 
everyone and how we can prosper together. We already got the wealth disparity. White people classified as white are already prospering well. Mr. Rappaport went to the beach mm-hmm. this summer. We already established that. That's how so many white people got private pools in their lawns and or they can go to the beach. Racism does not cost everyone that I, man that would be a major one right there like what in the world even if miss mcgee is she white do you know heather mcgee is she white she's not she's <sighs> she's black <sighs> never mind victims guaranteed qualify oh now see that gives me additional context because i didn't know about her book worth so this is a non-white person black female saying that racial justice policy advocate heather mcgee writes that as white americans began pray, paying for private schools they later they let their community pools fall into disrepair. A once public resource became a luxury amenity and entire communities lost out on the benefit. I was going to say that is kind of passive. Let their community pools fall into disrepair. That is so passive. That is a very, I think they'll sometimes say willful neglect. Sometimes they dynamited the pools. <laughs> this was not a, oh, we're just not going to get the weeds and we won't tidy up. This is a willful Black people are not supposed to have access to swimming, period. Um, but either way, well, check out Miss McGee's book, The Some of Us. What read, in fact, I thought when I read all of this, it reminded me, Kristen, Kirsten, excuse me, Kirsten Hextrom, her book, Special Admissions. She is a white scholar here in Oregon, mm-hmm. just a little bit south of me. And her book was motivated motivated by Operation Varsity Blues, Uh, about how mostly white people, uh, they had this scam and they were cheating and paying money basically so that they could get into these really prestigious schools. And a part of this, they were saying that they did like rowing, swimming, yachting, Mm -hmm. water activities, all these other kind of exclusive white sports. Her whole book, Special Admissions, the thesis is white people have disproportionate and deliberately pooled all of the athletic resources they've done this for everything but her book is specifically about athletics have pooled all the athletic resources so that disproportionately you have way more like white football players white tennis players white rower mm. just all of the sports pooling pools would be at the center of that but i mean all the rest of it too you just don't have and then they deliberately make it difficult for black people to access. So if you don't live in their region, you can't use our pool. You can't use our pickleball field. Mm. You can't use our site. You know, and they'll call enforcement officials. And that's what I thought. Of. Not uh, either one of those, the passiveness of Miss McGee's quote, or even what I say is the direct lie of Mr. Grayson Jarvis, the willful hoarding of resources and then excluding black the pool is just one you can just go like i said down the line with regards to athletic resources and or all things constructive that's what i was reminded of but have you have you heard of her book kristen hextrom special admissions uh i have not i kind of loosely followed that story when it was in the news because that the the actress on full house her daughter was like all wrapped up in that right yes sir but I don't know. I don't know a ton about it. But no, I, I haven't read her book. That's interesting, though. Yeah, it's same basic thesis. I thought it's so important as well because it just <laughs> it talks about how all, and that ends up you can go to college for free. Or she talked about that how you have all this dis- disproportionate representation at the NCAA level, not just for like swimming mm. and rowing and golf, but all this disproportionate representation of white athletes because of how they have pooled, literally (laughs) pooled all the resources for athletics into where white people live. And then for black people, like you had better hope you can get one of those private schools or a scholarship or something like that. Other than that, sorry, Mm. great book. And it reminded me so much as I was reading this work is you have a picture and you include Marielle Beeble towards the end. And she talks Mm -hmm. about the wonderful health benefits of having access to water and she's older. So just being able to get in, you can still get exercise and feel great. Is Miss, uh, Beeble, is she white, non-white? She's Hispanic. Okay. Is she white or non-white? Uh, 
I don't know exactly how she identifies. She's an immigrant from uh, El, El Salvador. Let me not misquote that, but um, she was not born in the U.S., I'll say that. Okay. I mean, they have individuals classified Listen, as... Sorry. Listen. Okay. They have people that are classified as white throughout so-called South America, Central America, the yeah. world. Um, and they do have on I the census... Say I don't I'm sorry? Identifies. I don't know how she identifies on, on the census. So. Okay. Uh, I said, uh, Mr... Grayson Jarvis, when I asked if he's a white person or not, you said yes, he's white? Yes. Okay. You know what a white person is. I'm pretty sure you didn't see his birth certificate to verify. Like, you can see someone and pick out, do I think this, do you think, Marielle Beeble, do you think a substantial number of people that are classified and accepted as white would accept her as white? No. Okay. Much obliged. I wasn't sure when I saw her photograph. I was thinking she was a little dark, but she did have a pool. So that (laughs) threw me off a little Mm -hmm. bit like, hmm, she's got a pool. I'm not sure. Eh." But okay. He said, yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see. I saw one person with a hand. I want to make sure I don't miss people in North Carolina who might have a question uh, for Mr. Ben Rappaport. You should make sure you read the report because it is fascinating. This might even be one. The pictures kind of do say a lot can i give two shout outs tracy watts great pictures great pictures the pictures do kind of convey Absolutely. convey Absolutely. quite a and and there's, there's so much in this reporting that really just like would not have been possible without her insights and her like continually brainstorming with me on this so huge shout out to her on this story right on partnership with the assembly and this is one the pictures are kind of Import, like I just said, Marielle, but you can even see her pool. I didn't even catch that when I saw it before. She's got her pool in them. She did great work to uh, Miss Watts. Photography is input. Journalism, man, is important. That's why that is appalling. 8%? 8%? That's mm-hmm. the flagship institution for you and the. Gee whiz, man. Gee whiz. Michael Jordan should have something to say about that. Uh, retired firefighter in Florida who always gives us the PSA if you own a pool be responsible children might come to your house to drown if you are not and to parents teach your children to swim the sooner the better the sooner the better retired firefighter in Florida did you have a question for Mr. Rappaport Uh, greetings, everyone, and uh, greetings to the guests. Uh, I am uh, quite happy that uh, you were able to uh, come on the program. Uh, what is what? What would be your plans on how to improve uh, with non-white people who race classified as black on uh, the life-saving uh, aspect of swimming? Are you asking me how do we basically teach more black people to swim? Is that what you're asking? Yes, you can say that. Yeah, you can put it that way. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I I won't sit here and pretend to have the answers to that. Honestly, I think it's such a big issue. I do think, though, the one thing I will say is that public pools really are sort of the the solution to this and we haven't as a country we haven't invested in building public schools since the great depression like the 1920s and 30s um so i think something that we need to see as our planet continues to warm as you know we grapple with the history of racism in the swimming pool all of these things that we talk about in this article i think something we need to to do as a country is place public investment back into our swimming pools um, to build more of them because, you know, how do you get more swimming lessons to black kids? Well, you have more pools available to them. Well, how do you do that? You have to build the pool. So I think um, public investment is, is number one. And obviously resources of all kinds are, are always going to be of limited supply, but, um, 
I think it's really it's easy to make the argument that a pool has the opportunity, especially uh, in a rural area, to be a community hub, to be a place that businesses can rally around, to be a place that families can rally around, that draws families into a community. So overall, how do we get more black kids swimming, we build more pools? And I think that that should be done through, through public investment. Okay, one last question. What would be sure. your uh, idea? Some, somebody said something? Okay, what would be your idea? Uh, because swimming is a base for a lot of things that non-white people who are rich classified as black are not are not involved in, uh, such as marine science. Uh, 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 there's an entire industrial activity that takes place mm. underwater. Uh, and uh, what would be your ideas and plans in order to uh, make that culture uh, impressive uh, to uh, young black people? Yeah, that is uh, a big question. Um, you know, I, I really don't know that I have a, a perfect answer for you. Um, I would say I think really all we can do is continue to, to educate our communities and, and teach them about the burgeoning industries in this field and, and hopefully just make people more aware. And I think that that has to start um, at a young age from, you know, really elementary, middle school, et cetera. Um, the younger we can show children and families and, and communities um, of color the, the importance of knowing to swim and also knowing all of the, the opportunity that knowing to swim can provide. I think um, the younger we teach them, the better because, you know, the same as language or learning really any skill, the younger you learn it and the more you're able to own the craft, the more it becomes a lifetime ability. So, um, yeah, I think really education is, is the key, although I know that's a bit of a, a non-answer in some ways. <laughs> and should that be provided in the public school system? I mean, I think so. There's, um, there's some interesting, you know, to, to for that to be provided in the public school system, again, it goes back to that need for public funding to really believe that swimming and pools and water activities are important to the public. Um, and again, that requires public investment, that requires people going to their community board meetings and their town council meetings and commissioners meetings and whatever, and advocating for this and, and calling people with the power to, to make that happen um yeah i think i think it you know i'd love to see it in the public schools i'm sure a lot of people would love to see it in the public schools but to make it something that actually gets into the public schools takes a prioritization and takes you know people advocating for it strongly for an extended amount of time okay thank you much obliged retired firefighter I was thinking I've been stringently opposed to tackle football as I have learned more about the dangers of CTE and mm. just the dangers of football, especially for your brain health for young children whose brain is still developing until 25. But you could even merge mm -hmm. the two. They just had a report. They said, oh, yeah, football is dangerous. You'll destroy your brain computer and all that and your knees and lots of other vital organs and things. But because of climate change football is now even more dangerous uh which is something they've been talking mm. about for a long time in terms of people people being going outside in august and playing it they had games even this past weekend because of climate change it was autumn official but they were still playing games where the temperature on the field was 103 degrees and hope he doesn't pass out and all the rest of it so merging the two we could transition from football to Pool sports. They could do water polo, 
synchronized swimming and they could have all of that matt phelps and all that just take up the space for the football field put the pool there bang that would solve lots of things no more cte everybody gets out of the pool with their brain computer intact but i am being a little goofy (laughs) also i was reminded the school component to get white people to invest in schools mr rapaport already told us that the attitudes of white people in north carolina they weren't even willing to make corrections about the pool safety and you know let's get these pools corrected and swim lessons and not yeah i am reminded we've had multiple white cows guests epidemiologists even who have told us with covid 19 unprecedented global health pandemic once news reports began to tie covid 19 to black people being impacted white people lost interest in wanting to even put on a mask now if you can't Mm. even mask up for black people that's about all i need to know in terms of how much you are willing to i didn't say any money give me a peanut butter sandwich let me have sex with your daughter just put a mask on (laughs) you are asking too much leroy (laughs) wow Wow. Uh, our caller at 3438, did you have a question for Mr. Ben Rappaport? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yeah. Greetings, Mr. Gus. Uh, greetings, Mr. Rappaport. Uh, greetings to all the uh, callers and the listeners. Um, I just had a question about um, the Columbus County Commissioner Giles, Buddy Bird. Um, and the role that he played in um, owning uh, the property. Um, I see you said that, I mean, uh, he owned this uh, property in Wedgwood, um, mm-hmm. that, and he he owns various uh, eyesores that they said, no, I guess they said that the white, the Whiteville Planning Department said he owns various eye, eyesores around town. Um, had, did this report... Mm-hmm. Uh, did this um, issue any kind of uh, investigation on him? And can you like give us any kind of background on the role that he plays in the in the uh, in the town? Yeah. So Buddy Bird is a commissioner in town. He's been a county commissioner for a long time. I think um, something something that's important to note about Buddy Bird and Columbus County in general is that we're talking about rural small town. Uh, places where uh, the good old country boys in power still uh, tend to stay in power for quite a while. And, and Buddy Bird is, is an example of that. He's he's a fascinating character for reasons I simply don't have time to get into uh, on this show. But, um, you know, our reporting on this particular topic did not, I, I wish it did, did not uh, initiate any kind of investigation by the planning department into the other properties he owns. But all that to say, he does own several properties throughout the county um, and surrounding counties. And uh, the planning department told us that several of his properties have become eyesores because he essentially buys them as investment properties at a low value to sell, um, obviously at a higher value, but then in the meantime, doesn't really too much to, to maintain those properties. Um, and the swimming pool that he bought uh, at an auction in 2014 is just one example of that. Um, and in our, in our reporting, we, we found this was a piece that, that didn't end up making it into the story. Um, but that group of, of community leaders that I talked about um, that were talking about reopening the pools, they, they were part of that bid to buy the pool. They just didn't have the funds uh, to, to outbid Mr. Bird in this case. So, um, yeah, he's, I wish I could say it warranted it or led to an investigation of some kind. Um, but unfortunately I, I can't tell you that. Um, but we looked into it. We know the pool is still overgrown with weeds and things like that. Thanks for taking my call. Much obliged. Yeah, thank you, sir. That is, once again, now that's the wealth disparity uh, between mm-hmm. white people, non-white people. And then 
he gets the property in fair bluff to do nothing with it <laughs> when you had a group we gotta yeah. go we got a plan like yeah he has the property he has the property in white bull just to clarify but yes white bull thing i got confused with my white name towns <laughs> whiteville Fair where enough. he has the property with and doing and they have pictures you can see it go to the report they have pictures of it mm -hmm. to do absolutely nothing let the rats scamper over the property and weeds overgrow everything you got a group with a plan like and and this will be public service civic good nah nah come on come mm -hmm. on they in fact they should have rushed from that article that is an embarrassment like he said hey you got 90 days to get this cleaned up bam and then we can give it back to the group who wanted it in the first place maybe they can get it at a discount and then we can get cracking with the swim lessons like come on that's asking too much yeah so i was gonna say so the the property in fair bluff we we contacted the property owner there um and it just so happened that that basically in the midst of our reporting like right as we were about to publish this story there was a hearing about the property in fair bluff um where the pool is that is owned by some guy out in charlotte which for those non-north carolina listeners is about three and a half hours away from where we are um so it's owned by a guy in Charlotte and he has said he's going to, Oh, I'm going to turn it. I'm going to reopen the pool. And then he said, Oh, I'm going to turn it into a baseball field. Uh, oh, I'm going to do this and that. And basically the, the code enforcement people, the people who would be in charge of, of doing something about the property um, have continued to uh, kind of let him say he's going to do all these things and given him more and more time to, to keep doing that. So. Just, just additional context there. Were you? I don't know. Did you get to to talk to any of the code enforcement people yourself? Yes. Yeah, we talked to to several of them. Were they white people, non-white people, a little bit of everything? Uh, I would say predominantly white people, but to be to be frank, a lot of them were just phone numbers that we called so i can't <laughs> verify that got it got it be curious in terms of who because that can end up being powerful and do you get more time as he said or are we there we said 90 mm -hmm. days and on day 91 we are outside ready to roll like that can be a powerful yeah city. we've talked about that in those small towns especially like oh my god like that is that's another conversation mm -hmm. anywho um, before we let you enjoy the rest of your uh, Tuesday evening, if folks had a question, star six one for Mr. Rappaport, you did mention that you have uh, other uh, reports uh, at the border or borderbelt.org. Uh, I did scamper down since we did talk about schools and pools the whole time. The report schools in North Carolina's border belt refer black students to police more often report says that one did catch my eye just for listeners, I'll read a tad. Uh, Bladen, Columbus, and Scotland were among 25 of the state's 100 counties where schools referred only black students mm, 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 to police for mm -hmm. disorderly conduct from 2017, that's even before COVID, to 2023, according to an October 19 report. That's 2023. Consequences of cops in North Carolina schools. During the report times during the report's time frame, black students across the state received disorderly conduct referrals to law enforcement at four times the rate of white students. Black students accounted for less than one fourth of the student population, but got fifty six percent of the disorderly conduct referrals in Scotland County. Black students make up 41% of the student population, but received all 64 refer man. Wow. All 64 yeah. referrals from 2017 to 2023, the report says. Black students make up 36% of the student population in Bladen County and 30% in Columbus County, where they have no pools. Uh, and and none of this has improved safety at all. This was another one where I was uh, kind of staggered. Go, go ahead, sir. 
Yeah, I was going to say just to, you know, this that article that you're referencing, I think we wrote it almost a year ago now. Um, so, you know, we've we've completed and, and reopened another school year and already across our region, we've seen numerous reports of schools shutting down early schools on lockdown, you know, school safety issues um, as and, you know, numerous, numerous student safety issues still at play in the schools. So when we talk about these referrals, yeah, they're, they're really not doing much uh, in terms of school safety. And that we literally, the guest we just had on the program was Michael Scholes. His son was killed during the Columbine massacre in 1999. Mm. Uh, that's, we've been paying attention to school shooting. That's, that's a point that we have harped on these school shootings and the threats and all of that that have been happening across the country overwhelmingly it is white people who are engaged in this activity uh, and not pointing that out is a part of the problem I contend even with something like this like are you serious all of the referrals for disorderly conduct are for black students all of the Colt 45 gray. I know that's not North Carolina, but all of these incidents of gun. I bet that have they had some of those in North Carolina too? the threats of we're going to shoot up the school or bomb the school or that sort of thing. Have they had any of those yeah. in the school? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. what I was talking about. Here. Yeah. So we've do, had a lot of those. Do you know if they identified any of the students or not? Do you know if, if it's been white students, non-white students that you've been, that have been engaged in this that's so far? Um, as far as I'm aware, it's been a mix of, of students. I, I don't, I can't make a blanket statement on that. I'm going to have to investigate some of the cases for North Carolina to see what's happened. And it's only been 30 days, but gold 45 mm-hmm. gray. No, that one's in Georgia. Some of the other, the, even the case in Florida where they shamed the parents, they arrested Colt, uh, Colt Gray's parent as well. But in Florida, they shamed the parents and then did the perp walk for the uh, young white 11 year old. They charged him with a felony, too. Uh, But man, that I've read one. I've heard this. And even this is one. I suspect it's probably with the report you authored specifically. This is probably mostly black male students, because that's the trend that I've seen. Did you get any gender information or no? Uh, That is a good question like i said we wrote this about a year ago uh i i want to say you're right but i don't think again i don't think that this particular report that we were writing about had uh gender breakdowns on that front okay it's been a year right on i wouldn't i wouldn't doubt it but yeah don't quote him on that one uh we'll Exactly. Hopefully they'll make improvements. I won't hold my breath, but maybe they'll make improvements. So this will all be antiquated, you know, by the time we get to it anyway. Uh, Looks like we got all the folks. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Lauren, did you have a question for Mr. Rappaport? Should be with us. Um, Yes, sir. I do have a question. In the article, um, when you talked about black people and white people, the B in black was capitalized, but not the W in white. Why did you do it that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a um, common common use by the AP style, which is kind of the 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 book of how journalists write in media. so the AP style book advises that you capitalize black due to sort of like the, I, I don't want to misquote their reasoning for that, but it's basically to do with like the cultural history and um, connection of black people. And that they say white people do not have. Um, yeah. That's a recent change for the AP style book. So the W used to be capitalized? No, the the W has never been capitalized. It used to be that black was also not capitalized until uh, about 2020, I believe. Um, yeah. And and just to be just to be clear on that, that was a decision that was pushed for for many years by the National Association of Black Journalists um, that they wanted 
black to be capitalized because they felt it was um, important. And, and here I'm quoting here from uh, the AP's entry into why they decided to capitalize black. They say AP style has chosen to capitalize black as a means of racial, ethnic, and cultural conveyance of an essential sh shared history, identity, and community among those who identify as black, including those in the African diaspora and within Africa. The lowercase black is a color and not a person. We now capitalize indigenous in reference to original inhabitants of a place as well for similar reasons. Um, it goes on to say there are other such capitalizations of groups of people such as Latino, Asian American, Native American, et cetera. So that's a little bit of an explanation there. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, do you think the W should be capitalized? Do, uh, personally, I, I don't. Um, I think I think it's important to sort of show the. I don't know. I don't. I don't actually have like really strong feelings on this, but I think the fact that this is a thing, like the capitalization of of black, was pushed forward by basically the most prominent group of of black journalists in the country. Um, and they explicitly said in their efforts to not capitalize the word white, like, I think that that's the, the advocacy that I'm going to stand by and, and choose to listen to. So I think that that's uh, why. Thank you, sir. Much obliged, Lauren. Uh, Mr. Rappaport, do, do white people? Do you all, you're classified as white, so I can include you. Do you all have a <laughs> shared history, culture of practicing white supremacy racism? You know, that's, uh, I mean, I would, I, I guess so. Yeah, I would say, you know, folks who are white are, are complicit in white supremacy. So I would say that, that um, yeah, that's fair. Oh, we got the double F bomb on that one. Fair. And folks, I point out folks on a consistent basis because we're talking about the most powerful people in the world. And then we get very folksy about talking about people who are super powerful to bomb the pools or keep you out of the pools and schools. These are not folks. These are powerful men and women. Uh, but I've observed that frequently. Uh, and I think the shared culture of white supremacy racism, that's why I put the capital W for white. But I don't have the same views as many folks. Um, did you say you even as a man classified as white uh, are complicit in the system of white supremacy racism? Did, did I hear that correctly, Mr. Rappaport? I think that's true. I mean, I think my existence as a white man is makes me pretty complicit in white supremacy, whether I, you know, choose to participate in it or not. Mm. And a lot of the, you know, the, the, what's the word? Internal, not internal, unconscious biases that I, that I hold. I think, you know, as much as I want to unlearn them and undo them and, you know, be, be as anti-racist as I can, I think, um, yeah, I think we are complicit in, in those structures of white supremacy. Hmm. Much obliged for the honesty. Uh, who do you, who do you think is more informed about what racism, white supremacy is, how it works, uh, meaning the, the mechanics of how it operates day to day. How do we keep the black people out of the pool? All of that. Who do you think is more informed? Uh, do you think people classified as white are more informed or do you think non-white people are more informed about what racism is, how it works? Oh, I mean, I think undoubtedly uh, non-white people are more <laughs> informed about how racism works because they experience it every single day. Uh, and, and I, you know, I just don't have those same experiences as a white person. 
Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, but I mean, Hey, I have read some of your work here. Uh, the abandoned pools of Columbus County and, uh, schools in North Carolina's border belt refer black students to police more often. You are informed about racism. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I learn every single day and I will continue to keep learning on that front. I would say I'm informed about it for sure. Right on still learning myself. Uh, we have been mm-hmm. chatting, chatting it up with uh, Mr. Ben Rappaport, journalist down in well, at least for me geographically uh, down in North Carolina uh, talking about his uh, great reporting uh, you can check it out borderbelt.org uh, the main report uh, that we focused on uh, the abandoned pools of Columbus County uh, anyone, the, the swimming issue and racism, white supremacy you should definitely check it out. If you have any connections uh, to North Carolina, you should definitely check it out. And even some of his other work that deals directly uh, with the system of white supremacy racism. Uh, I learned a ton. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your Tuesday evening with us, Mr. Rappaport. I know we will be keeping an eye out for future reports down at the border belt. So keep up the great journalism, sir. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. This was a pleasure. For sure. Mr. Ben Rappaport, evening to you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Context of white supremacy. Lots of North Carolina. I think there are several states, right? You say, hey, we have done a lot of reporting. North Carolina, Mississippi, California, uh, Illinois, because we've done a lot of reporting on Chicago specifically, but Illinois in total. Uh, a few more I probably could think of. You gave me more time, but lots of information on the Florida for sure. Lots of information on some of these specific regions. I cannot stress enough. Uh, if you, wherever you happen to be at, you should study racism, white supremacy at a local level, local state study. What has happened, what's happening right now, what has happened, all of that. You live in North Carolina. I wouldn't care, you know, if you're like Mr. Rappaport, if you just moved there within the last decade, last five years or so, start studying, especially if you think, oh, I might end up being here for a few years. Start studying. They keep mentioning this Wilmington Purge, 1898. What is that? They got documentaries. Christopher Everett done two. We had him as a guest on the program. They got books galore on that. Michael Jordan talked about that. That's uh, where he spent some of his time in North Carolina before he got to Chapel Hill. Uh, but you should be informed. Robert F. Williams, if you're you know connected to North Carolina, you should know who he is. You've read his book. Or if it's other regions, wherever it happens to be, Washington State, California, Louisiana, study the local system of white supremacy racism in your region. And you can make that you should make that an individual family counter racist research project that could be a lifelong project because new books are always being published so you'll kind of be on the lookout new material new documentaries comes out on a specific subject matter if it was North Carolina if you all you know have been studying Robert F. Williams or even if you studied Robert F. Williams let's say in 2014 Robert F. Williams documentary comes out in 2027. Oh my goodness. We'll get together and watch that. Be constructed. We'll go back and get our notes from the book and boom, boom, boom. We'll be talked about and all that constructive. Or it could be lots of things for North Carolina because they had the uh, sit-ins during the so-called civil rights movement and slavery. Civil, lots of things uh, that you could talk about. You know, do and. That would apply for any located, not even the U.S., anywhere in the world. Family research project. That's something you can even pass on for generations. You know, we do research on something we pass down. These are, you know, books, notes, information that we gathered about all this. Boom. Grandchildren pick it up and they go, might turn into a book or a project or or just this is something constructive we can talk about other than what you watch on Netflix. Anything good on TV? Mm, what that Will Smith up to? 
just so that we have a little bit more than entertainment, hip hop, name calling, could act and might even motivate reading non fiction. Now I have at least one book to see or maybe several books, right? We pick a certain subject matter or it could be a person, you know, born in a specific area. Lots of things, lots of ways. Even it could be James White Highway. Who is this dude? Let's make that. We're going to read the fact. Is this plantation owner? Who did he own? Let's see. Did he own any of all of that? We Lots of ways that you could do that research constructed. That could be individual. If you have a care mate, you too do this. Like I said, family project. Take, you know, mom, dad, all that. They can go hang out, talk about things that they remember or what have you. You could even pick something if you have elders. Pick, you know, things that they remember. Events that happen. And you can go back and we'll go to the library and research. Pick something that, you know, really stands out. An event that you recall that happened in this area, the city, the state, county, whatever it is. Pick out that event and we'll go see. We'll see if they have any books on it and we can read it together. We'll get several copies. Of, they have an audio book. Come on. I think a listener even said they were talking about having like a family. I don't know. Uh, reunion. Maybe they didn't say reunion. Like, I don't know. Or maybe they did. We'll say reunion. Like a family reunion during the summertime. And they're going to like get together, go to the beach. Typical thing lots of people do, right? Get together, go to the park or what have you, outdoors, enjoy the sunshine, bring some food. And he said, uh, how about we get an audio book? You know, we pick out a book that I really want to listen to. We sit down, we listen to, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, or we can read a little bit of it, and then we can talk about it. What kind of lame is you? <laughs> there was one but I thought like wow that is pretty cool like cuz I mean they do have a, they have audio books that are narrated by like James Earl Jones and my and like people that would be like wow that's James Earl Jones <laughs> like I, anyway maybe that maybe I'm lame too but anyway I thought like dang get some food go out to the beach comfortable spot ch- Man, and these are people that you care about. You can have your children. We're reading. We talk about it. We look at the beach. I didn't say you have to read the whole book. <laughs> Once that you read, you know, maybe one chapter, maybe half a chapter, you know, and we chat a little bit. And then, hey, maybe we reconvene and people read the whole thing. And we continue the dialogue. But I mean, anyway, research project. Counter racist forgot that very this is not just reading for giggle's sake counter racist research project can be an individual thing certainly if you are one of one you don't have your care mate or whatever it is that is one of one and then it's easy because then you don't have to compete and and waste a week arguing over what topic we're going to research or what we're going to read next or what's the next book or None of that. You can just, you know, let your motivation and curiosity guide you. But certainly that's something if you have offspring. Dr. Kanban talked about doing this, taking his offspring to the college library to research, explore, roam around, all of that. And to talk about and study white supremacy racism. Research projects research projects counter racist keep leaving that out counter racist research projects anywho we will take quick commercial break be right back uh, context of white supremacy hold that thought if it's constructive and from the late 1960s, after the death of Martin Luther King and the riots and the upheavals and all like this, and black people with their fists in there and all like that and trying to stumble and fumble and find their way and get focus, the white supremacists made a blueprint and put it in action. And that is, I'm going to have these people so confused, they don't even know what they started out to do. And by the late 1970s, they had just about completed it. And we've been on that ever since. And you mentioned something very important. 
safety. I'm more comfortable than ever. But see, it's like making gorillas comfortable in a cage or monkeys or pandas. You still got them in a cage, but they're comfortable. See, so give him some bling bling. It's like giving an animal a brand new car and training the animal to ride up and down the street in it. And then you stand back and point at the animal. Like one white man said in the late 1950s, he said he doesn't care what kind of car a Negro has. He said he's still a nigger. And when he rides by in a shiny car, to him, it's just a monkey in a car. White people built a car, put a monkey in it, trained the monkey to drive the car, so now you're looking at a monkey in a car. See, but black people don't see themselves that way. But this is how the white supremacists see us, and they are the ones who run our business. And we have to know that, that when they look at us, that's what they see. That that's what they see. That that's what they see. And at a subliminal level, what they see begins to spill over into our brains so that we, at a subliminal level, see each other that way and indirectly see ourselves that way. Context of white supremacy. We will be here on Wednesday, getting it, getting it. Be here on Wednesday. We'll be here every day through Saturday, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, every day until Saturday. You just lock in. Shouldn't be any confusion. There really shouldn't ever be confusion about what time the program comes on because it's always the same time. Just be, are we broadcasting today? yay or nay every day through the rest of the week it is yay we are broadcasting 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific same time as always invest if you think the cows is constructive listener supported counter racist radio hit the blog racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com paypal button in the top right corner just beneath the button you'll see the links for paypal cash app venmo much obliged to all of the investors who have supported us for 15 plus years hopefully we have been worthy of your time and energy you'll also see the link for the amazon wish list under it is listed under gus t renegade enormous gratitude again to all the investors who have nabbed an item or 10 from the wish list over our 15 years hopefully we have been worthy of your time and energy accurate more often than not Uh, you can always support the cows uh, by sharing the broadcast with other victims of white supremacy if you think they would benefit be a little bit less confused about what racism is what it means to be classified as white from hearing the context of white supremacy I'll share now just because I'm not sure I wouldn't include this on the book club I don't think and then we have a guest tomorrow and it's not neutralizing workplace racism I have to wait till Saturday which I guess I could do but it's like man with the election and things being as they are there might be lots of things to discuss between now and Saturday I guess Uh, pause for Marcellus Williams I mentioned privileged black male Marcellus Williams some months earlier when I said solstice or not this, I think this is the uh, autumn equinox. Autumn equinox. I said the season change 
kill a black person. Same way I was saying, oh, they released Dahmer right at the equinox a couple years back. I said that a few months ago, and of course we're not going to pardon privileged black male. Get on out of here. Anyway, um, but I'll share now because, well, that would be one, another one to discuss in detail for the compensatory call in this weekend. But for, I'll share it now. The book that we just concluded, The Zebra Murders by Bennett Cohen, Prentice Sanders, allegedly. I say Prentice Sanders didn't have anything to do with it, whatever. Uh, the white man wrote the book. The Zebra Murders. These alleged crimes, black people killing white people, 1973 to 74. We just read about all this. The same era, Jim Jones, on the same street as the People's Temple in San Francisco. Uh, same era as the Symbionese Liberation Army, the Black Panther Party, and so much Watergate. So much more. We literally just read this book. We spent about, I don't know, two months, I think exactly. There were eight parts reading this book. I thought, and I think Jim Jones is connected somehow to these murders. And the one black male who is still alive has maintained his innocence for 50 years at this point. He's been incarcerated, greater confinement for almost 50 years to the day. Or not to the day, but almost 50 years exactly. Uh, I wrote uh, Larry Green, the lone surviving convicted murderer in all this, black male. I wrote him uh, just as we were finishing the book. See if, you know, he might be interested in chatting about this case, what happened, all of that. We do the interview with Michael Scholes this past Sunday. Monday, I'm prepping for this program and what have you. Uh, I don't even, I don't do phone calls and talking on the phone. Mr. Fuller, you know, talks about that. He doesn't hang out with victims of racism. I'm totally with that. Plus, I'm not a cool person anyway, so I don't hang out, all that stuff. I'm not accustomed to talking on the phone and people calling me or anything like that, but strangely enough I had just turned my phone ringer up I was going walking I think doing something totally unrelated I hear the phone ring I go get the phone answer Larry Green's sister I am stunned like whoa we're done with the zebra murders we're reading about Patrice Lumumba too late for you beat it I'm trying to recalibrate like, whoa, 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 zebra, zebra. Let's see. Get it back. Larry Green. Okay. 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 I got it. Got it. Got it. Boom, boom, boom. She's like, uh, so he got your letter and he wanted me to chat to see who you are. So now I'm having to like on the spot, like zebra murders. Yes. Not Columbine, not Patrice Lumumba. Zebra murders. Yes. San Francisco. 73, 74, blah, blah, blah. And I was telling, I had to start with People's Temple, right? Just to be truthful. Like, so how did we get to zebra murders? Like, oh yeah, we spent all this time with People's Temple. And then I was, I was thinking, I was like, I mean, it is the same time period. Like, Jesus Christ, it's the same time period. It's right on the same street, like People's Temple. So we're reading all that. And that's how we got to the zebra murders. And I was telling her about the book that we read and, you know, all the rest of it, that it just sounded ridiculous uh, for people who didn't read uh, that they had this group of black people that they called the death angels going out killing white people. like are you serious like it just sounded like the goofiest thing in the world not believable at all uh, and so I'm telling her uh, all of this and so uh, she's <laughs> man she starts going into detail about the case like yeah our brother did not do this he said he's innocent I can't my brother uh, she said I you know I can't speak for the other black males who were convicted in this case but at least for my brother Larry Green he did not do this they did not have any evidence they did not have any fingerprints they did not have a uh, murder weapon they did not have a witness who observed him at the crime scene the sketch is ridiculous which is the exact thing I said in the book club repeatedly like I said I would have just grabbed that sketch held it up because it doesn't look like any of the people that were convicted I would have just held up that sketch and then you got this lame informant, Anthony Harris, who she, she said is allegedly still alive. You got this lame police informant to come give a statement that, oh, yeah, these guys did. Then he retracts 
all of that and said, oh, no, no, I'm going to retract I lie. And then he comes back and reasserts that, oh, no, what I said before I retracted, that is actually true. And they did it. I would have held all of that up with that lame sketch dismissal. I wouldn't have asked for uh, acquittal dismissal of charges. You don't even have enough evidence. This shouldn't even have been an indictment. This They say you can't indict a ham sandwich. Hey, you ain't even got no swine on the bun. That was a good one. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, but it should not have been an indictment. I mean, I, I told his sister, I said, man, they didn't need no OJ Simpson. They could have got a flunky. You don't have no murder weapon. You don't have no fan. The fingerprints you got. Wait a minute. The fingerprints you got. Your lame informant. If it's going to be a, if we got to have any sort of deliberation, Anthony Harris convicted. Get him out of here. That's not what they gave him the reward money and convicted the other black people. Anyway, uh, I, man, are you flipping serious? So I talked to his sister. Um, I talked to her long enough that I actually did get comfortable enough to tell her that I do think Jim Jones is related to all of this. Then I was even more stunned because she immediately grasped the suspicion of the people's temple being right in the middle of all of this. You got all these murders and even the black Muslim temple that they say these black people were going to. It's right there. It's directly next to the people's temple. Jim Jones has nothing to say about it. Anyway, she immediately recognized the suspicion and she even added, I've heard this before. I kicked myself for not asking. Can you give me the names of the people who also think Jim Jones had something to do with the zebra murders? I would like to talk to them or read whatever they have published. Anyway, um, may I would love to chat with Larry Green, the zebra, because she said, I watch true crime all the time. I never see this case. Me either. Any hoodles, hopefully there will be more to come. But if anything, man, for that to happen 24 hours from when we spoke to Michael Shoals, I was already saying it with emphasis on my chest. Oh my God. Can I have the match? We will never, 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 never 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 read fiction again on the cows i would smack someone if they recommended fiction ever 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 we're ignorant about everything read non fiction until white supremacy has been replaced with justice there's nothing to read but non fiction Everyone should write a black person in greater confinement. That should just be bedrock counter racist code. For about a billion reasons, they say everybody is lonely and whatever. I was going to say, like, you should do that, like, for your child instead of grounding them, like, make them write a letter to a prisoner, but then that associates it with punishment and all the rest of it. That should just be, hey, <laughs> Everybody, at least I can't even, that's kind of lazy to say you wrote one. Everybody should write somebody in greater confinement. Everybody. Write a black person, non-white person, victim of white supremacy in greater confinement. You might stumble into Marcellus Williams. Detroit Red. Joan Little. Who knows what they might be able to tell. Remember Acres of Skin? Who knows what they might be able to tell you about COVID-19? They got experiments encouraging the black people to rape other black males. Who knows what they'd be able to tell you? I've been here for 50 years and didn't even do it. You seen Shawshank Redemption? Who knows what they'll be. Everybody should write someone in greater confinement. Non-white person in greater confinement. 
wow, if I get to speak to Larry Green, I will see if we can get lots of details. Uh, if people did not listen to the zebra murders, it is short. You can go back and that is a whack. I th- man, I wished even more once I got off the phone with her. Like, man. Oh, and, and. So a part of the validation, his sister says, so let's hear the book club. Catherine Massey. Say, okay, send her the links. Explain to her the format and all that. We have news clips. On the one hand, I was very pleased to have Jim Jones audio so, you know, he can be heard from the archives talking about the zebra murders case. May Brussels uh, from the archives of that time period talking about the case and then some of the other news clips from the time period. Very glad to include all of that information. Not that she hadn't heard it before, just anybody listening, really, so they have some context uh, so that they know kind of the way the book club tries to operate the setup so that people can be a little bit more informed about the people and time period that we're reading about. Uh, And then I was kind of like, I hope I did not sound like a damn fool. Uh, on the book club. Or I guess I hope we didn't sound like damn fools on the book club. But I did con- conclude that it was some malarkey. So we'll have to uh, see. At minimum, I'm glad that we got lots of contemporary news reports from that time period so that hopefully it is conveyed that we took it seriously. But man, if if whew, I guess this would be another point Anytime you're talking about white supremacy, racism, take it seriously. That's why I'm so opposed to people calling into the book club and, you know, talking reckless if they haven't been paying attention and just being off topic and talking wild. Uh, You never know if this is something about white supremacy, racism. This should be serious. And being off topic is not serious because you're not paying attention. That is not serious. If we're talking about white supremacy, racism, we should be serious at all times never know who's gonna hear this if you i could not have even imagined larry green is going to listen to this book club yikes and even i was even more terrified like so if larry green did not do this and this is a privileged black male who's been in vacaville prison for 50 years and he's going to hear us talk about this book in his life. E. I hope I didn't sound like a damn fool. Reading is more important than watching television. We should all write a black person in greater confinement. Cosmically, that is going to last with me for a while that that happened 24 hours from speaking with Michael Scholes and all of that is because reading is more important than watching television anyway today's broadcast also reading get your child swim lessons uh said so proud one of our listeners she attempted black mommy didn't know how to swim got swim lessons for her child and herself spectacular demonstration of black self-respect and still learning teach your child how to swim it might be you know a great effort Right, if they've closed all the pools down and they don't have a YMCA and all of that, but man, whatever you have to do, if they have a relative who lives 30 miles down the road or what have you, first summertime comes, you already looked in advance. Springtime, boom, boom, coordinated, bam, six weeks in the summertime, swim class, you are doing it and you explain it. This is counter racism, and in fact, it's racism that you got to go 30 miles down the road. To your auntie's house and do this over the summertime that you can't we don't have a pool here or YMCA we don't have public pools and all that it is deliberate willful white supremacy racism in fact that could be another project right there 
what is the local history of swimming pools did we ever have a swimming pool did they have a black beach that they let the black people go to was it a specific day that they allowed the black people that would can be an easy beautiful one right there right there and and now if you want to be morbid although i'd say pfft, if they need any encouragement mom this is lame i want to be with my my friends i don't want to do this i don't want to go stay with auntie it's lame eh. you can go and get the reports now let's see how many black children died your age over the last few years didn't know how to swim let's go learn how to swim wasn't it hot remember that day it was 105 degrees wouldn't it be nice you could go swim mm -hmm. swim lessons swim lessons can I give out a kudos if I if I have to to poo on everyone forever for fiction recommendations when we heard the audio report of Mr. Rappaport last month uh, on the compensatory call in check the local news that's how I heard about his report we heard that report he was asked by the black person interviewing him did he get to swim in Whiteville not fair bluff Whiteville and Lawrence said he didn't answer the question about if he got to swim in town now I put that on my list to ask more, not that I was equally curious like yeah yeah he didn't answer the question me. more so just because once I feel like that's counter racist code if a black person asks a question even if it's not my question if I have the opportunity to ask that question I'll do so so I put it on the list we'll ask darn if it did not come up organically as they say when it's he brought it up the we all are hurt by race he said the non-white people we just are kept down. old Marcellus Williams is kept down we are all hurt injured by racism kept down that's what they said Mar Marcellus Williams you, you've been kept down my black brother that's what they go <laughs> kept, kept down what what the kept downs I said really we we all are hurt by I said brother brother Rappaport did you get to swim he did the exact same thing he did all those flim flammy and they ain't got no pool and if I was gonna swim I had to get all the way down to the beach and pick the dick then I said that see 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 Lauren had that one immediately I told you I told you I well no if I if we name called I could have name called right there but we don't name call white people we just name call Leroy but old racist suspect I knew it because he did the same thing when a black female why is that why do you have to lie about just oh yeah I got out there and got me a little swim time got my new bathing suit and showed off I've been doing my push-ups you know I do a little yoga got that plank pose down brother my shoulders woo. no no couldn't we got to ask twice just did you go swimming well man <laughs> like what what make sure you get your question answered if you have to ask twice you don't have to be rude you don't have to curse and jump up and down but just man did you get in the water Jiminy crickets what in the world uh fair this is I normally don't keep a tally of how many times they use fair. I just try to point out like oh we got an interesting use of fair we had lots of interesting uses of fair and lots of uncomfortable chuckles throughout even when we got to the end are you informed about racism yes with chuckles did you get to swim we had chuckles there as well the use of folk I pointed that out before we're talking about the most powerful people in the world they can dynamite pools and nobody goes to jail these are not folks now you say gangsters mobsters thugs toughs terrorists that would be more like criminals folks 
Langston Hughes even has a book with that in the title, The Ways of White Folks. Victims guaranteed qualify. These are not folks. Unless you're talking, even in the gangster parlance of Chicago, no. Because that's too region specific. If you're not Chicago, that doesn't really, you know. Uh, let's see. The O oh, in the numbers, when he said, I remember when I read that in the report, and he said, the senior facility, they tend to seat themselves along racial lines. He said the facility is 75% black. Unless you got some evidence that those black elders say, whoa, 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 whoa. I ain't got over the Woolworth yet. Back up. Back up. Back up, Hortense. Don't sit over here. Not We ain't doing no bingo. Nothing. Get over there. Stick to the way. You all wanted it whites only before. So it's going to be whites only until we check out. Beat it. That is not what is happening at the senior for especially 75%. So you got this small little group of white people over here. It's why are all the white people sitting together? That's what you got. Ain't that many of us here? Oh, Lord. We're going to have to have. Come on, Paula. Oh, it's so many of them. (laughs) That's what you got. You would have to give me some. They talked to you. I asked him. They talked to you. They didn't say, get out of here, white man. Beat it, cracker. You don't talk to no white people. You already see. We told them to get away, too. Go over there and talk to them white people. That's your relative. Them your people. That's not what happened. I'm sure them black people, they the black elders, males and females there, I'm sure they would have talked to those elderly white people. They were racist before. Why would they not be racist now? Probably that's some of the white people who made sure you niggers not going to have anywhere to swim. Sat along. And then and then bring up the tenant. What can I say? Victims guaranteed qualified. I know it's a black female who brought that second time. Remember, I mentioned it from the symposium they had at the University of Washington where they brought up that book and sassed me. Oh, my God. That's another one. You can throw all the fiction in the trash and that book. And put it on the black, you see that? Put it on the black people. Why are all the, but nah, man, nah, man, nah, man. Why are all the white people swimming together? Why are all the white people banking together? Why are the white, all the white people lynching together? Why are all the white people practicing white supremacy racism together? That is the book. And then have the audacity for some white person. And get enough white people do it that now black people say, yes, yes, remember that old American classic right up there with the hate you give. Why are all the niggers, I mean, black children sitting together? Oh, it reveals so much of it. Get out and then say, say, there is a chapter about why are the white people sitting? Nah, man. Nah. Why are white people blowing up the pool? Why are white people lying and saying that this is separation when they're raping black children? That's one I should probably start with all the time. Like, that should always, always, always always be called out emphatically because it is such an enormous lie and that is a part of why we are confused we being non-white people victims of racism this is not about separation i always give my definition uh, definition for racism out we have white guests on the program it doesn't say anything about separation that is not what this is about you cannot have a system of white supremacy racism if it's just going to be people classified as white we're going to be separate we're going to stay over here this will be our spot you nigger stay if that were the case we wouldn't have no cows there would be no need they lie even that lie oh we're gonna get together in the pool and that rape out again get off of that child strom didn't we hear about that last week what are we reading in the book club right now andrea blueween what she say my white dad was 40 my black Congolese mother was 13 separation man we wouldn't have this pro- Andre Blue- Andrea Bluin wouldn't exist if this was about separation I would love it if we had some separation that would stop some of this child rape and other acts of racism Nothing here about no separation, nothing here about no segregation, integration, none of that. This is about mistreatment, mistreatment of people that they say are not white, especially if you're classified as black. 
separation. Like, come on, like lots of us get convinced. I used to think like, yeah, so that's not the issue. That is not the issue. Anything. Uh, let's, I forgot to get Javion McGee. He mentioned the black female McGee, Heather McGee, whose name is spelled differently, but phonetically, Javion McGee, 21-year-old, did die in North Carolina. That is not the same region. That's Vance County, not the same region as here. I was going to ask him just offhandedly since he's in the state if he had been paying attention to that case. That is one I forgot. My bad. Uh, let's see. Did I get anything? Forget anything. And the uh, Marielle Beal, because I did see, I told you they have great pictures. Uh, Miss Watts, great effort. Uh, but Miss Beal, I saw her and he mentions Latina in the report. But I said, man, I don't know. Is she white? Is she not white? I said, if I was looking at her, I'd say she's a non-white person, non-white person, not classified as black, but a non-white person. I said, I'll ask and see. And he said, Latina. Now, even that, he felt comfortable with the other individuals who are classified as white. Is he white? Yes. Mr. Jarvis, some of the other folks, is he white? Yes. Boom. No problem. Boom, boom, boom. You didn't get verification there. You're confident this is a white person. What is the issue about just saying, no, I think she's non-white? You know, I give my, if Hitler says all the non-white people are going in the oven right now, is Miss uh, Beale is she going into Beeble? Is she going into the oven or is she going to be safe? I don't know why that's when we have to, you know, be ambiguous, deceitful about either. Uh, it's not even about her classification, like I said, because he didn't ask to uh, verify with the people that he thought were white to make sure, like, do you identify as white? To, you know, say, no, I don't identify as white. <laughs> see if they were Scandinavian or Elizabeth Warren, say I'm Native American, right? Any of that old stuff. What is the the big deal? You see someone who is dark? Well, I don't think they'd be accepted as white. No. Master deceiver. Make that's another one. Make sure you get your question answered because I think he responded with Hispanic the first time, and that's not the term that I use. Sometimes it can be as simple as that. Sometimes if you at use a specific term in your question, make sure they don't switch to a different term that has a totally different meaning. That's like we had that white guest before from a different part of the world and he used the term benefits and then tried to suggest that benefits means the same thing as practice. It does not. Words are very, very important. Whiteville. Fair. Bluff. The names of James White Highway. I was stunned. Like, wow, this is like a lot. Like, we got it. We and then and then they'll do all that and then come back and say, hey, uh, (laughs) white people are ignorant. And and this is all unintentional, really. Whiteville was white. Whiteville. That's just down the road from where you all had the white supremacist coup. Uh, yeah, it's just accidental. Hmm. Hmm. That, that is about as accidental as them having 8% of the journalism, journalism school as negras at UNC. What a disgrace, man. I wonder, does Michael Jordan know? Can we get Michael Jordan upset about that? Can you go down? Because I'm sure he could, you know, get some influence, like make them do better, man. They can get some more. But we need black journalists. Like if anybody can holler at Michael Jordan, make your alma mater do better, man. Go down there and shame those folks, man. You could do a lot. Go down there and make them get right. Get some more black students at the journalism school. They could cover Michael Jordan. Have good things to say about you. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Folks have commentary they need to get in before we wrap up here tomorrow 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific and Thursday and Friday and Saturday active as we go down the conclusion or I can't even say conclusion just began autumn 2024 uh, let's see folks who had questions our caller 3438 retired firefighter uh, Lauren did y'all have anything stood out satisfied Uh, for me, uh, it's kind of like a learning process. Uh, since the establishment, I think of 
racism, white supremacy, they have been un, un uh, interrupted in the process with uh, water that which includes the seas, the shores, uh, the inner waterways, uh, because it's a political and military uh, advantage uh, uh, for that. Non-white people, especially non-white people, race classified as black, it is constantly has been interrupted. Uh, like I said to, like I've mentioned to the the guests, uh, swimming is a you know foundation of some things that I mean, of course, drowning is vi- very very important, but all the other things that are essential to uh, people on the planet Earth to get goods, to get food. Uh, trade uh, that all it, it, the, the sciences that are still being founded in waters that I think it's called marine biology uh, that sort of thing uh, we don't have a whole lot of access to yes you do you would have maybe one or two you know a small amount of non-white black people who managed to to uh, with their will and also from the standpoint of the white supremacists uh opening the uh opportunity for them to get through but nowhere near on what it's supposed to be of course and those are my thoughts and uh, that basically was was the uh motivation of the question that i was asking much obliged retired firefighter in florida uh that long-running illustration of white terror talked about it uh the land was ours andrew carl he talks about all over the u.s it's not specific to any one state where he talks about that process in detail and how white people have refined their ability to do this restrict black people's access to pools beaches lakes water uh lauren did you have commentary I don't have anything. Much obliged. Much obliged. Let's see our other caller. Guess he was good too. Right on. Uh, let's see. Right on, Sim. Everybody got their thoughts in. Uh, folks in North Carolina, I would say read, maybe even read a few of them. The school report that he had was interesting as well. Incidentally, I did try to check to see if they had sh- school shootings and or closures in North Carolina my very abbreviated look they had a shooting I was not able to even confirm that this was at a school it looked like the shooting did cause schools to lock down so that certainly would be uh, close enough Uh, but I'm not sure if the actual shooting happened at the school because you know sometimes if it's close enough like outside or whatever that can trigger lockdown too so I'm not exactly sure on that one Uh, but most of the reports it seemed like they were responding to the other shooting incidents that have already happened this school year basically this month um, that have happened in other areas and them responding in North Carolina to make sure that they had policies in place to keep students safe and reassuring parents and all the rest of it. I have to look to see, you know, what what exactly has been happening in North Carolina with the closures there specifically. Uh, again, if we have any guests, if they are in North Carolina or if you are down to do research, James White, plantation owner in North Carolina, slaves, all of that. That's the person that they named the highway after. It's common enough that it could be, you know, a different white person. Maybe they did something non-slave related that was worthy of recognition but uh let us know that's the person that i found uh having just learned about this highway in the last 24 hours or so uh if you find any info on that let us know until justice at gmail.com until justice at gmail.com much obliged uh write someone in greater confinement they have so many black people in greater confinement just at minimum, I suspect there would be a lot of folks who would just be cool. Have someone to chat with, constructive, 
right on. Maybe you can talk to them about white supremacy, uh, white supremacy, racism, and you can have them. What are they doing behind bars? May Brussel, some of the information that she got about what was happening in the 1970s, she got talking about experiments that they were doing on prisoners and she had sources who were behind bars where she was able to talk to them greater confinement. She was able to talk to them and get direct information. So everybody, I think that should be kind of you can you can practice your writing. Listener recommended that some years back and they say people are lonely in need of contact. I suspect that would certainly be true for the likes of a uh, Marcellus Williams, Larry Green. Mumia Abu Jamal, they lock up so many black people unjustly. So many black people. Ever that could even be one locally, right? Check the news, what have you, and find a story, black person who's in greater confinement where for whatever reason that particular story guilty, innocent, whatever, uh, where that particular story resonates with you. Right, if they can be in your state, that would make it easier, I would think, but find a black person greater confinement non-white person can be anywhere in the world should write them I think that that right there that would probably be uh, constructive for many reasons and that's so easy and cheap that's I don't think that would take an hour I'm trying to think the letter that I wrote to Mr. Uh, Larry Green I think that took <clears throat> it was a full page I think that took maybe I'm going to say 30 minutes maybe Maybe not even 30 minutes. Full page. You can make it shorter. You know, <laughs> it doesn't have to be a thesis or what have you. You can build up some time uh, to where, hey, maybe I have two pages of things to say, or I got lots of questions about the wacky things that you are telling me are happening in greater confinement. Like, can I get some more details? Have you heard of Neely Fuller Jr., Dr. Francis Cress Welsing? Just at Det- uh, Detroit Red. Detroit Red. I'm sure that's this not the first time this suggestion has been made, even in the counter racist context, but certainly worth repeating and following through on. Like I did not, you know, wasn't really expecting it to be that immediate, but hey, pick somebody in greater confinement. If anything, hey, they probably are looking for have a little conversation, something other than what I suspect might not necessarily be the most constructive dialogue in the Huskow, as they say, greater confinement. I'm going to just wager that many of the other inmates are not quoting Dr. Welsing and Dr. Cambon every other minute. I'll wager. I could be wrong. Any hoodles, uh, much obliged folks tuning in. Hopefully, if anything, we motivated, maybe you can write someone in greater confinement and then swim lessons, swim lessons for you, swim lessons for your offspring for sure and even look for ways if they have like discounts scholarships to make it a little cheaper that sort of thing uh they might even have programs for free for children if you can catch it you know at the right time or what have you but research especially on a local level research that's when they might even they might have something in the paper uh maybe in the springtime preparation for the summer for that sort of program so maybe like spring 2025 you can kind of be checking the local news local outlets uh, community outlets community centers see if they have any swim lesson programs that sort of thing for your offspring or you if you need to learn how to swim Uh, sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy they have talked about water safety includes being sober you don't want to get intoxicated and then your equilibrium is off and you boop splash into the water especially in these regions Seattle where the water is very cold they said if you have been drinking and you fall in that cold water you can go into hypothermia very quick sobriety would be best creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time 
we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately no name calling black people no gossiping no throwaway offspring teach your children to swim teach yourself to swim at any age never too late to learn just like counter racism cow signing up thanks all for tuning in nigga you so brainwashed i'm a victim Your brother problem. a victim i'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning shut up the man has programmed my condition mm -hmm. even my conditioning has been conditioned <laughs>